Hey everybody. So, I'm not really sure where we're going to go with this tonight because it's one of those things that is a lot of different pieces to cover and it was sort of brought up in a somewhat vague way. So we're going to talk about this as best as we can and kind of wait till the conversation exhausts and go from there. Make sense? Cool. So, the thing that we're going to be talking about tonight is death. And Xena specifically had mentioned that one of our one of our members of our server brought this up because it seemed like a really good idea in it. So Xena, you have a response that you had done, some of the ideas that you would wanted to talk about in this. Um, do you want to read the person's message and then also like these ones and then maybe, you know, your response? Um, yeah, so some of the context uh, from our person was uh, last stream just was talking about death and I said love lefty conversations about death. And she told me to type in in content suggestions. True. Uh, I did I'm, that. Right? Right? That did happen. I'm good with any talk about death. I find it all interesting. Fear of death. What happens after we die? The allure of death. Um, and here's me going all boop, Jess. Um, and so some topics that I think that came to mind immediately when I first saw this um, was death in the existential or Zen sense. Everything ends. Um... Two, I have a lot of experience personally working with seniors and my grandma before she died. Um, and I find that that puts death in an interesting perspective for me. Um, and it's not always one that I hear about. Um, and then three, dealing with death of loved ones close to us. Um, yeah. So those are kind of some of the pieces um, that we've kind of been brainstorming around this topic. Because there does seem to be a way in which I think death is not always you know, talked about or engaged with. Um, yeah, well, and, and it goes into the things we've talked about before, so sickness, old age, and death, right? So I'll start, yeah. maybe, is it okay if I start from the Zen perspective? Yeah, go ahead. So, death is a tricky one when talking about Buddhism because it depends on the school, it depends on the lineage, it depends on a lot of things because everybody frames the stuff differently. In Hollow Bones, the idea was is that upon death, the self returns to emptiness, fades away, disappears. It just ceases to be. It was not permanent to begin with, it just fades out of being. The the neurocognitive biological processes that were keeping this bizarre hodgepodge of consciousness together cease functioning and it's released back into the ether. The reason for this is that in many cases, if you look at a lot of early Buddhism, the idea was is that Buddha wasn't really interested in the idea of what happened after death. He wasn't interested in... He wasn't really interested in, like, what happened after or who created the universe because to him, these were sort of the unknowable questions. They are questions that don't really mean anything because they're fundamentally unknowable. And so the way he talked about it was in a parable of an arrow. And he said, it's like you've been struck with an arrow, but rather than ask me to fetch the surgeon... You ask me, what type of wood was the shaft made out of? What type of stone was used for the arrowhead? You're asking the wrong questions. And so we start from that premise is, is that to talk about death is to talk about the unknown. It's to talk about the inherent mortality of human beings, right? Sickness, old age, and death. These are unescapable truths that will happen to all of us. They may happen all differently. We, some of us may escape into old age with no problem. Some of us may be struck with cancer. Some of us may be struck with lots of things. I, as a person, personally, have been struck with a lot of death in my life. Um, most notably, when I was in my early 20s, both my mother and my wife passed away. My mother, because of ammonia toxicity and a coma following a fairly long battle with cancer, and my wife, because she was in a horse riding accident, a dog wasn't properly chained up on a piece of property. The dog ran out, spooked the horse that we had named Zephyr that we were boarding. The horse was unnaturally fucking nervous. And this is what happened. She hit her head. She was in the hospital for five days. She never woke up. Both of these people I had to choose to terminate. So to me, death is not this. Death is not this thing that 
is this distant idea that will happen later. When I've talked about on this channel about having my own existential dread about getting older and all that, it's because I know where these lead. I've been in the hospital watching a loved one pass away. I've been in the situation where I've had to explain to a child why their mother wasn't there anymore. And so to me, when talking about death from the Zen perspective, the reason why I think this idea makes the most sense is because it's not really an idea in and of itself. One could make an argument that it is by its nature a theism, that is the idea that there is a, an, a life after death, thus a religious notion being pre prescribed. I tend to think of it as the most frameworkless idea that what death could be that seems to go with what everything we know at this point is. The simple fact is, is that anyone who says they know what happened after death is probably either not, is either dealing with some sort of state experience, a la our integral training, or they can't. They just can't. They may have gone through spiritual experiences. They may have had very real, like, um, meditative states where they were in near-death kind of coma stuff. But the reality is, is we don't know. We only have near-death experiences. But we have no idea. The idea of ghosts, the idea of an afterlife, the idea of purgatory or heaven or hell or paradise or the inferno or all of these things are human metaphors created to describe what we think could be there and often as a way to sort of create and construct a notion of justice in the afterlife. The good go to heaven, the bad go to hell. The problem I have with this is that I think it's a security blanket. My issue is, is I don't have a problem with religious beliefs, but I think that they tend to existentially avoid what we're actually talking about. Namely, that when I say, oh, I can go to heaven, or I can go to hell, you know, if you're not bad, if you're not, you're not good, you're going to go to hell. What I'm doing is sort of banking on this idea that someone made up or had the spade experience of and assuming that that's the reality. But in simple terms, there's no way anyone can fucking know that. And the thing is, is that, well, Danger Fairy, I agree with you. In physics, energy is neither created nor destroyed. Human consciousness is an energy. If we've looked at the integral series, consciousness, non-duality, witness consciousness is not energy. Energy, if we want to use the spiritual terminology for that, is subtle energy. That seems to come about later. It arises from consciousness. It is not consciousness. So, to me... I think the problem is, is that these stories about an afterlife, these stories about ways in which we continue on or we go to another world or all these things, my problem with them is, and if you believe otherwise, that's okay. I'm not trying to convert anybody or tell them differently. But for me, I am very skeptical of these beliefs for two reasons. One, they feel like someone's selling me something. And two... They feel like ways to evade our own existential dread. If there's a heaven, death doesn't mean anything. If there's a paradise, death is just a change. But to me, there's no way to know that. So to me, it seems like a clever story created to create security. And based on the sort of dialogue or narrative idea of the self, that makes sense. We want to have this idea that the self continues on, but it doesn't. Based on all evidence that we can find, and one can make the argument that maybe we just can't detect these folks. Maybe there are ghosts. Maybe there is heaven. My take? It doesn't matter. They're still gone. No matter how much I hope, no matter which faith I practiced, I was Catholic, I was pagan, I was satanic. I've been every faith I could find trying to argue and understand a way that the deaths in my life weren't just bad happenstance. And the fact of the matter is they are. They were because of cause and effect, karma, real karma, not the, not the idea of the Hindustani notion of karma where this is like a like a weird spiritual, like, tally system. I mean karma in the Buddhist sense of causality. My mom died because she had gotten a blood transfusion when she had me and had contracted hepatitis C, which then caused damage to her internal organs. 
which then created cancer. My wife died because she was a practice dressage rider where, who didn't wear a helmet ever because she trusted her skills and a situation arose where she needed it and she wasn't ready. She wasn't being smart about it. It sucks. It hurts. I was devastated. I nearly put a hole in the hospital wall. But to me, to say they're just in another place is feels like a dodge. It feels like a way to not have to be with the pain. It feels like a way to not have to actually be with what is. And the problem is, is I'm a Buddhist, at least ostensibly. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that's what Zen is. It's being one with what is. The first statement you learn coming into the Zendo, no matter how it's said, is be one with what is. The problem is people love that when it's happiness or goodness or t candy or babies or puppies. But when it's shit and it's sadness and it's hurt and it's grief and it's darkness, then they pull back. Then they hide. Then they don't want to be with reality. And I'm not saying you have to wallow because that's a form of attachment. It's about being with whatever's coming up and not attaching to it regardless. Or from the Mahayana sense, from the Zen perspective, attaching to the things that matter. I'm attached to my partner. Being in a relationship by definition means that I am preparing for pain. By being in a relationship, it means that someday either I'm going to go, or Xena is, and the simple fact of the matter is, by choosing to be in a relationship, I am choosing pain because all relationships end. I've said this in couples therapy. All relationships end. You want to see people like literally just drop everything and stop talking about nonsense? All relationships end in either breakup or death. That's it. So if you're going to be with this person, how much time, what time do you want to do with this? It's, but it's not sad, Ash. That's the problem. That's the framing issue I have. This is where I, this is where I get so confused. It's not sad. It's just reality. And what it means is if you had an infinite enough, if you had an infinite amount of time with any being, then the meanings and the moments would be useless. They would be meaningless. They would not, they, 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 they would have stretched out to no value. But because I have a finite amount of time with this chat, with my life, with my partner, with my child, with my dog, every moment is fucking precious. Every single fucking moment. So you be one with what is so you don't miss the moment. So that's the Zen view, or at least my Zen view of that, if we want to get technical. So that's the Zen view. What else did we have? Let's see. And please jump in at any point. I'm just riffing. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think... Um, I think I've got two parts. Go ahead. Um, I'm still kind of formulating some thoughts here. Um, yeah, I think with death and, you know, kind of being okay with the pain and that understanding that that's part of the reality um i i don't really want to have a day where like you know my last moments with just was a fight but in that i also recognize that like that fighting and that pain is also you know part of our relationship right and that still has value to it for me um because there is only so many moments and the fact that I, I can be in a fight with somebody and have it be loving and caring is, is fucking mind-blowing and brilliant and amazing, right? Like, I also really love those parts, and especially when PMDD hits and random depression and, you know, anxiety that doesn't fade for a few days hits, I think the best 
thing that I try to keep in mind is just that I still like being here. I like being with my partner. I like my life. And like, yes, like I could make choices to, you know, not be in a relationship. And that would suck. That, that honestly terrifies me more. Um, but I think the big thing is just recognizing that I am still choosing to be here. Like every single day, every single moment is me choosing, yes, I want to be here in this. Um, and that's, I think, where I, I think about the stuff in my day to day life. Um, I spent a lot of time <laughs> uh, in my young 20s. Uh, one, taking care of my grandma. She was in her late 90s. She was late 80s to 90s, okay? Um, and uh, she was getting more and more dementia. She eventually came to live with my mom and I. Um, you know, and, and watching her decline was really rough. Um, you know, we would buy her word searches, and one day we would buy her, like, the adult, and next sixth grade, then third grade, maybe first grade after that, right? We were going backwards. Um, yeah, and I just, I kind of had this realization at some point that no, like, this would end, and it's okay. Um, like, she really was that old. Um, you know, and, and through my time there with, you know, working with her, I was also helping out at a senior living facility because my mom worked there at the time and she just always needed people to do stuff and so you just show up and they're like you're the best thing ever uh <laughs> the uh follow your dreams i got that speech a number of times uh you know and you keep coming back and occasionally i would hear that somebody you know i was hanging out with or talking to the week before died um and that was kind of rough at first um, and, you know, that kept happening. You know, maybe, you know, once a month, maybe one or two people died. This this was a, a facility that was kind of like, you know, followed people from, you know, kind of seniors just looking for, you know, a smaller place, you know, that could also um, house them and, and provide more care as they needed it throughout, you know, the rest of their life kind of thing. Um, and so I just kind of got used to this acceptance that just no really be there like just be you in as many ways as you can and you don't always have to talk to people or be um you know super communicative certainly not all of the seniors are um my grandma definitely wasn't but i think what i came out with that was just being in that moment just being around um was the thing to do um, and there were a lot of people that I remember, and it is, you know, I don't know if I feel sad. I don't know if sad's the right feeling. I kind of feel at ease um, with that, with that stage of life. Like, that's what's coming. You're, you will eventually come to an end, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Gay fesh, I did avoid my grandma towards the end. Um, that did happen. It gets too hard to see sometimes. My grandma had actually basically stopped communicating. Uh, even before she was in, you know, uh, like the Alzheimer's ward at, at that facility, she really had stopped talking. In fact, I think her life was pretty tragic. Uh, I have... As I have pieced out more and more stories, I actually think content warning, there was probably abuse from her husband that I don't think anyone talked about. I don't think my mom did. I don't think grandma talked about it. Um, yeah, I actually think there was more of that stuff going on than what my family let on. Um, but... Mind if I add something? Yeah, go ahead. So one of the things I want to be really clear with is, is that, and I've seen this, people do this thing sometimes, is in their attempts to sort of master a fear of death, they start LARPing that death is this really important thing. And I guess what I want to be really clear with everyone about is, death is just death. 
it's neither it's neither something that is not scary and it's also something that just is it's not this thing that we need to fetishize or overly attach to either. That's just going to lead to more suffering. You're not really in life if you're constantly thinking about death. I think it's really important to understand this because from that understanding of being a finite being, that's kind of the existential read, is that by definition, you have questions. How is one radically authentic? How does one be in relationship? What does it mean to do good? What does it mean to exist in some ways? Because think about it to this degree. In 1,000 years, no one will know any of us ever existed. They may know of our civilization. They may know of specific burial sites. But the idea that they will know about you specifically, that you will have some impact, is pretty unlikely. And the people who is still, are still in our history didn't plan it that way. They just ended up that way. This is why I say nowhere to go, nothing to do, no one to be. Because people hold themselves this idea that they are this hero, that they have to be this singular person in the narrative and story, and you don't. That's a tremendous amount of weight to put on someone's shoulders. So what we have to do is just accept that there will be death. You're still allowed to be afraid of it. You're still allowed to be deeply hurt and sad and painful when someone you, lo when you love dies. And you do your best. But I think this is really like an important thing is, is that if we're talking about death from a mental health perspective, one of the best things someone can do is go through and just allow themselves to feel the grief. Allow themselves to just experience it. One of the things we do as human beings is due to apprehension, we hold ourselves back from feeling pain. We do not allow ourselves to feel pain. We don't allow ourselves to feel the, the ouch of the sting of the bee. We don't allow ourselves, but we, we run from it. We hide from it. Even if we get an itch on our nose, we don't sit with that itch. We just run from it. And in the same way, if someone passes, allow yourself to be with that pain. Don't wallow. Don't overattach to it. Don't stay stuck. But feel it. That's the point of the feelings. They're there to be felt. They're a, I heard a great description of this earlier today. They're a tunnel to be walked through. A tunnel to be walked through. A feeling is a tunnel to be walked through that we go in through the darkness and we come out the other side. To me, feelings are just information. They just bring it there. If I feel grief and sadness, it's because I've lost something in someone I care about. To me, death should neither be so terrifying that it keeps one from living, nor should it be fetishized. But if someone passes in your life, feel that pain. You're allowed to feel that pain. It's important to feel that pain. I think it's okay to acknowledge that too, right? To actually say that stuff to yourself. One of the reasons why I can talk about the death of my mom or the death of my partner is that I don't... I've done enough work on this to where and enough time has passed that it doesn't hurt anywhere as much. Things have shifted. Things have changed. I don't really resonate with the person I was that was with my ex. That person is gone. Several iterations consumed them. Different changes, different evolutions of my own personal growth. And the most recent one was the complete disillusionment of me as a man. The idea of being in a heteronormative relationship as a wife doesn't make sense in my head, and as a husband, certainly it doesn't make sense in my head. So if you've lost someone recently, the only thing I can say is I'm sorry for the loss, and allow yourself to feel it. 
when it's appropriate and when you feel ready. But just let yourself open to it. Experience it. I think this is the best way to handle things because then you're allowed to move past them. As I said earlier, a thousand years from now, no one will know who we are. And the reality is, is you only exist in the memories of the people around you. How long before there's no memories of me or Xena or anybody that we know right now? They might be in a history book for doing something important. They might be remembered by as someone's great, great grandmother by a name. But in reality, and this is the important part, As Yalom once said, I believe it was Yalom, father of existential therapy, real death is when no one remembers you. So, that's okay. We're allowed to be okay with that. Now the trick is to not think that because of self-worth issues or because you hate yourself or self-loathing but simply to realize that, again, just like every other human being that has come to pass on this planet, every other ape before us, you'll come into this world, you'll have an experience, and you'll leave. That's okay. For whatever reason, that's the reason, that's the way things are constructed. Also, I, I did want to add, I think it's also okay to recognize you are also personally dealing with mental health issues and other things in your life, right? The other half of that story about not really being able to be with my grandma was that I was, due to shitty circumstances, in a different house. Um, also, chemical sensitivities had started around that time, too, so my body was never... Stable. I was getting migraines constantly. But I think it's okay for you to recognize both that you are in a difficult place and having a hard time and also recognize you know, what somebody else might be experiencing. Um, I think it's both okay to be with what is in that situation, right? Um, not necessarily taking all the blame for it, you know, but certainly just recognizing where you're at. Um, you know, and I, I think it's okay to show up and be in pain. I think that's the big thing. It's okay to be in that spot too. There was a question over here in YouTube chat asking, why does it matter how we cope with death? It matters because... How we cope with death will define how we interact with life. And what I mean by that is, is if we fetishize death, we're not really living. And if we run from death, if we hide from it, pretend it's not real, we also don't really live. We don't really, we really aren't with what is. This is why I'm fundamentally against funerals as they exist now. Maybe this is a spicy take but I hate the funerary industry. I hate it. And the reason I do so, spoiler alert, is because I think they're a lie. Not that they're lying about what they're doing, but in the sense that when you go to a funeral, as long as the body isn't too mangled, they'll put it back together. I would say more so, Ash, because they are basically selling you the idea that your, your loved one isn't really dead. Think about it. They go through the, the, the putting on the makeup, the filling them with incredibly caustic chemicals that embalm them. They put them in a box that will toxify the earth. They put them in clothing. They try to make them as living as possible, really just turning them into a simulacrum of themselves or a doll. They're selling the idea that they're not really gone. And I think this is horrible. It means we avoid this. My honest take is, is that I think, from what I've heard, and maybe I need to verify this information better, but in the, uh, 
maybe it was the Victorian age, maybe it was shortly after that, but there was a point in time where the custom was essentially in the United States was that until the gravedigger came, your loved one just rested at home. If they were dead, they were dead, and they'd stay in bed or on the couch or in some play particular form of thing. And so to me... I think that got people okay with death. It allowed them to see that death was something happening. They could see that the person that was once inside there, the consciousness that inhabited, inhabited, inhabit, inhabited them, is gone. Um, isn't that unsanitary to let them stay there? They would have to start the decomposition process. That takes longer than a couple days. In Nepal, there is a practice of sky burial because the permafrost people cannot be buried in the ground. Yep. So they take the bodies out of the field, butcher them, let the vultures eat the remains. I think that's the best practice, better practice than what we do, in my opinion. I agree, Fesh. There's, there's countries where uh, you have to pay for that grave spot for X amount of time, and your body totally gets buried. I don't know what they do with it afterwards, but you only get to be in the ground for so long because they'll have so much room. To be fair, yes, Danger Fairy, elephants do remember they're dead. Elephants also get drunk on fermented fruits and destroy villages. So I'm not, I don't know how much I want to base stuff on elephants. <laughs> not to mention the ways they <laughs> violate and hurt poor, poor rhinos. Just just look up... Um, Hood Nature. I, he's got a new name. It's um, Casual Geographic. Oh, no. Okay, well... Right? Um... When uh, elephants enter their whatever their their weird masculine fucking thing is, this is a side note. They actually leak a weird like testosterone fluid from their eyes, and they just go to town. They're not because there's way more men than there is women, and so oh must. That's right, must. They go into must or musk, whatever it is. That's true. Humans destroy villages, but again, uh, an elephant can just crush the fucking thing. So imagine that you're just like. Live in your day, and then half your village is gone because of a fucking stampeding elephant that got drunk on berries. <laughs> so, I, so we've descended into yeah. nonsense, and that's usually how this goes. But I just I want people to understand this is like, I'm not trying to sell any kind of spirituality here. I'm not trying to sell any kind of idea of what it is. I'm just explaining how this stuff is stuff that I've dealt with, and as somebody who's dealt with death fairly, re you know. I want to say recently in their life. I mean, not super recently, but recently enough. I think it's important to be with this stuff. I think it's important to talk about this stuff. It's important to recognize that the form you're in is temporary. And that means every moment is fucking precious. I think this kind of existential understanding is one of the reasons why I, I find trans people so fantastic is... There is a very real way in which trans people kind of realize that existentially you only have so much time. I need to change things. If I only have so much time. Yeah, I'm a little hesitant about using anything that Perma Chodra says. Niana, she allowed a lot of abuse in her community. Um... But I do think she has some nuggets of wisdom. I just think her leadership skills sucked ass. Um. I do. So that you talk about trans people and, and this idea that like, you know, being with what is. Um, and I definitely have people use the toxic end of like, OK, I've cut out some family members. All right. I've done it. Hey, per and what? Oh, go ahead. Finish your thoughts. Sorry, I'm responding to the perma children discourse go finish yeah. your thought um i don't ever want the potential death of somebody to be hung over me as a coercive maneuver just saying um if somebody's like no you should go reconnect with this person and i'm just you know going and i and like completely ignore that like this person has done you you harm like no that's a problem that's coercive um I want to make choices for me that better me, that put me in a position where I am doing well and I, you know, can have healthy, positive relationships with the people around me. That's what I want. And going back to my abusive parental units is not 
part of that, right? This acknowledgement that, like, no, I get to be here and I get to make a choice about my time and what I do with myself every single day is a thing. Um, and yeah, I just want to touch on that because I've heard so often that people use that and I just don't think it's a good reason to stay with somebody. I think... I'm going to be honest, this is the, like, there are four things I agree with this person on. I have to kind of go with the Lily Orchard video on this one. I just think that forgiveness with certain things is impossible. I think you, I don't think we should ever, I, I, like, people are talking about forgiveness. It's not just with abusive people. I think there is a point where people cross the moral event horizon and we're just kind of fucked. Um, because being a bodhisattva is learning to only choose your attachments. To me... I don't need to be attached to people who want to hurt me, even if they say that's for my own good. Um, as a note to the people in chat, um, so the thing about Parmachodra is, is my understanding is there was abuses in her community. That doesn't mean the things she said are, aren't good. It means that, again, people are more complicated than we give credit for. I've had incredibly realized teachers fucking zot my brain, and they also turned out to be awful fucking people. I'm looking at you, Mark Gaffney. Um... Allegedly. Um, <laughs> and Jason, I also still mourn the lost time. The lost time sucks. I've mentioned this in a previous video. Being trans, I think you mourn the lost time regardless of when you, stop, when, when you start transitioning. It just seems to be part of the fucking thing. Can I be honest that I'm like... Super mourning the time that I spent... Going for a dream like a career that I really wanted to do and still find myself not healthy enough to be in. Sergeant Renegade, we do check YouTube chat on occasion, so feel free to post stuff there. I will check it when I can. Um, no, I mean, that that's definitely a place of mourning and sadness for me, especially right now. Um, you know, with the school year starting, I find myself kind of missing school and missing that challenge. Um, and... Trying to figure out ways to be with my body as it is. Which is not, not easy when it's having a month of migraines that don't end, so. Yeah, I would say if you wish to be a bodhisattva, like in the Buddhist sense, the idea is that, again, not only does freedom not mind its chains, freedom, does it, freedom chooses it. This is the fundamental issue that conservatives don't understand about choice. They think choice is the ability to not have restriction. I say choice is to choose the restriction when it's necessary. I wear a mask because I want to. I got the vaccine because I chose to. It doesn't matter what the fuck I did it for. It matters that I made a choice. I feel like a lot of, this is from Lucy. I feel like a lot of philosophical concepts are nice, but harder to put into reality, like the whole love your neighbor stuff. Like, oh, I have $20 and I don't particularly need it. And someone needs $20, but it's someone I don't particularly like or has done harm to me. What do you, I assume, do is the end of that question? Like, what do you do here? Yeah, I guess my question would be is, is that, like, love thy neighbor, like, what are we referring to as a neighbor? Are we talking about, like, geographical neighbor? Are we talking about someone who's part of your community? Because there are people who are my neighbors that I know for a fact aren't part of my community. My community generally exists online. It exists with queer people. I don't really experience community with a lot of like cis, straight, het folks. Now, people in my community, that's a different discussion. But yeah, it's, it's, I don't really, I don't really have a strong connection to the place I live. Yeah, with the gays, as Jason said. So to me, it's like, what is a neighbor? What do we mean? Because if we're talking about the, like, the physical geographic location, no. I, I mean, I would help them if they were on fire or there was something bad happening and I was able to intercede in a way that would be useful. But yeah, I mean, I kind of go with Vosh on this one. And that is, if you're able to do good and nice for people, you probably should. But I don't think it's like a bad thing not to unless like that's going to create problems. Like, again, like, if someone's starving to death and the difference between getting a cheeseburger or death, probably give them the cheeseburger. But if it's like, should you donate your money to like a soup kitchen? You probably could donate some of it, but 
if you're also struggling to make ends meet, is that a good expenditure? Is that really doing what you need it to do? Like, I'm never going to say charity and compassion are good, but it, there's a lot of, like, ethical milieu that play with there, guys. Yeah, philo and the thing with philosophical concepts is that they need to be concrete enough to, like, actually be applied to real life. Okay, I grew up in a Christian church, all right? Um, if you're Christian, cool. My experience was not that great. Um, and there was a lot of stuff that was just tossed out as things you should do, but they really, like, the loving your neighbor thing, like, absolutely ended when I came out as lesbian. Suddenly, the, the, the nun who had known me since I was very little was acting really strange around me. Uh, you know, and yeah, I think, again, if your philosophical concept seems, you know, yeah, yep, yeah. If, you're if, you're, if the concepts and, and principles you're trying to follow can't actually be applied in real life, then what are you doing? Yeah. I mean. No, so. Absolutely. I feel so like that's a lot. Yeah, that's, I think we covered a lot. So why don't yeah. we why don't we let that go here? Um, also, uh, as we said, you should only really donate to things if you're able to, and it doesn't hurt you. So mm -hmm. feel free to donate to us. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, thanks for watching. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. Um, if you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. You can also ring the bell if you want to be notified of our videos. Um, if you want to help the channel, you can donate at streamlabs.com slash transgirltherapist slash tip. You also can uh, become a patron at patreon.com slash transgirltherapist. As low as $3, you can support our channel. Thanks for watching.